Hello, everyone, and welcome to the digital conference of day one of the EFMD Global Fairs powered by Hired. My name is Amber Wigmore Alvarez, Chief Talent Officer of Hired, and it's my great pleasure to be Since the moderator this of this conference, where you will hear from Anna Strauss, who is currently the head of the Integrated Talent Management Unit at the International Organization for Migration, the UN Migration Agency, which is headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. So I'll briefly introduce her, and then we will be watching a video from IOM and then handing it over to Anka. So just let me share a bit more about her background. She joined IOM in 2001, and among others has held the post of Chief of Mission of IOM in Mauritania from 2014 to 2017, and Morocco from 2011 to 2014, as well as the Deputy Permanent Observer at the IOM Permanent Observer Office to the United Nations in New York from 2005 to 2011 passionate about talent management, succession planning, mobility, and reinforcing the competence of staff. She joined the HR division in 2018, and given her field experiences, where dedicated skilled staff were always an issue, she was interested to make her knowledge and her experience available for IOM in this post. Anka Strauss is a German national and holds a law degree with a qualification as judge. Welcome back once again, Anka Strauss, to our digital conference. And now let's watch a brief video. Hello, Anka. Hello, everyone. Great Hi, to have Amber, you back. Thanks for having me back. Excellent. Now let's go ahead and watch a brief video on IOM. Dedicated to promoting safe, orderly, and regular migration while harnessing the potential of human mobility. In 2016, IOM became the UN Migration Agency, giving migrants a much needed voice on the global stage. The organization covers a broad range of migration areas, such as assisted voluntary return and reintegration, border management, climate change, labor migration and development, camp management, humanitarian and peace building, or research and policy on all migration topics. IOM's dedicated staff are providing policy recommendations and operational support to governments in over 600 field locations in more than 100 countries across all continents, from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. IOM is ensuring that the well-being, safety, and dignity of people on the move is always respected in emergency and non-emergency situations. IOM is an equal opportunity employer with a diverse and engaged workforce of over 25,000 personnel, providing high quality migration services to beneficiaries. More than 90% of IOM colleagues are based in field duty stations, working as doctors, nurses, lawyers, economists, psychologists, project managers, emergency coordinators, social workers, engineers, and much more. IOM seeks committed professionals with a wide variety of skills in the field of migration. On the IOM's website recruitment page, www.iom.int slash recruitment, you can find all the information about what kind of profiles are required in the organization and how you can join. We encourage you to follow IOM on social media to keep up to date with the latest work and exciting opportunities. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that, Anka. Now, I just want to encourage everyone watching us from all over the globe, feel free to put your questions in the chat for Anka, and I will be fielding those to her throughout the session. She has a presentation to share, but we welcome it to be interactive. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Anka, and keep the questions coming for us. Thank you very much, Amber. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are calling in and attending uh, the fair. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak to you again uh, from the IOM Human Resource Department. And I'm pleased to be speaking about the geopolitical kill impact on talent acquisition and hiring, because there is some. Um, just to give you a little bit of context that uh, has been highlighted uh, also in the, in the uh, video, 
which was a bit fast, so I'm repeating it. We've just celebrated our 70th birthday. Uh, we were founded in 51, but are the youngest kid on the block uh, in, um, in, please go to the next slide. Um, uh, we're the youngest kid on the block in the UN system because we joined just uh, a little over five years ago. And again, um, I think what's important is it's a huge workforce across the globe, but we're 172 nationalities at the moment, and that's still growing. Um, and so uh, we de definitely are interested in having um, a <clears throat> very diverse workforce and a very broad workforce to address the needs of, of migrants and governments alike. Just in terms of looking at <clears throat> what we're what we're uh, aiming for, we have passed the two billion US dollar mark in terms of budget. But I think it's also important that uh, besides diversity in terms of uh, geographical diversity, we're looking very much at uh, disability and inclusion. We're looking at LGBTIQ plus, uh, but also an important factor is multilingualism. So I would definitely uh, encourage you to make sure that you are uh, also investing in a, a second or a third language, um, in particular for IOM, it's English, French, and Spanish. And then, of course, the additional uh, UN languages, uh, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian are uh, indeed helpful. Next slide, please. Um, I think what's important in terms of what we're, what we're doing is in order to understand uh, what migration is in terms of the wide uh, variety of activities um, is really, um, we're looking at uh, a lot of uh, very diverse substantive questions in terms of refugee resettlement, acutely uh, now Afghanistan, Syria, and uh, now Ukraine. Uh, of course, um, climate change is in everyone's mind, emergency and post-crisis and disaster risk reduction, so a little bit more proactive. Um, the whole question of migrant assistance, what do we do with um, migrants in need, whether it's uh, unaccompanied migrants, children, whether it's victims of trafficking, whether it's uh, people in need uh, who have a migratory background. We're, of course, also looking a lot more at labor migration and migration and development. Um, we're looking at border management. It's a huge uh, factor when it comes to migration. Um, how, how do borders get managed and how do uh, governments get support by uh, an organization like IOM uh, to help um, migration health? It's a huge, I mean, I don't have to tell you, it didn't begin with COVID, uh, whether we were looking at Ebola, where we're lo whether we're looking at TB or other diseases. Uh, there's a lot of um, work in migration health. Um, I already touched a little bit on migration and climate change. But of course, a lot is also law, it's policy research, it's migration law on the one hand, so really linked to what is migration legislation, uh, but also, of course, we have a huge legal department that deals with contracts and uh, personnel questions and the like. So this is the, the one side of the story uh, where we're really talking about the migration-related topics. But then, of course, we also have the other half. I'm a good example. I've actually crossed over from the first half into the second one, meaning uh, operational management. Uh, so we're talking about uh, human resources, budget accounting, finance, risk management, law. Uh, I mean, you, see, you can see the list here. Uh, investigations and compliance is becoming more and more important and more and more uh, asked for also by, by donor governments. The whole question of how do you how do you manage um, knowledge and and uh, how do you manage relationships to donors to just name a few. So what I'm trying to say is, on the one hand, we have a huge group of colleagues uh, who work on substantive migration questions, diaspora engagement, remittances, and the like. But then we also have uh, the others who are working more on the support uh, sector. So both are. And I often get asked, well, I've studied, I don't know what, um, human resources, would you have, or I've, I'm a, I have a, a PhD in accounting, would that actually help? Yes. We even have uh, engineers who drill uh, wells, or we have um, IT colleagues, we have, uh, so the whole range. I sometimes say, I hardly think that there's 
a degree that wouldn't be helpful in the work we do because we have such a diverse portfolio. So if we're looking a little bit more at the very recent uh, activities that are ongoing, <clears throat> and this is just really a very small overview, um, is of course on, in everyone's mind or, or in the newspapers, the situation in Ukraine, we're providing humanitarian assistance. We had prior, <clears throat> sorry, prior to the war, um, a large office in the Ukraine, uh, over 300 colleagues and uh, several field locations, not just in Kiev, but in particular also in the East, but also in Odessa. And um, so currently now the situation is obviously extremely changed for what we do. It's come much more to humanitarian assistance, it's cash assistance to IDPs, internally displaced people. Um, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. Of course, we're also present in the surrounding uh, countries. We're present in Poland, we're present in, uh, in Moldova uh, and in other countries, and we're providing support there that is quite different from within Ukraine. Of course, Ukraine is now on the forefront, but if you look at the other uh, five, six uh, examples here, they are all still emergencies and they are still uh, in difficult situations and need to be, not be forgotten. So if we're looking at Cox's Bazaar, for example, in Bangladesh, um, it's a continued emergency and relief support for the past five years. And we still have almost a million Rohingya refugees that we're providing support to in Cox's Bazaar. You have the situation in Yemen, um, which is ongoing uh, for, uh, for the past, what, almost 10 years now with um, life-saving multi-sectoral uh, humanitarian and recovery assistance, almost 200,000 uh, beneficiaries. It's an extremely difficult and volatile situation and certainly not gonna go away anytime soon. Haiti, um, I had the opportunity to work in Haiti after the uh, earthquake in 2010. And um, so it's, it's a bit of a disheartening situation where you really see a country that is ongoing in a crisis once the earthquake has in some shape or form gotten um, under control and, and restructuring is ongoing, reconstruction is ongoing, <coughs> land and property rights are being addressed. You have a, a hurricane coming or you have a flood coming. It seems the country does not come uh, really to a quiet situation. Again, uh, we, have a, we have a large office present across uh, the island and of course now um, um, are, are providing assistance to hygiene and emergency shelter, among Sorry. others. Anka, if I could just interrupt you, we have a With couple pleasure. questions coming in from the audience. What are your biggest challenges to attract and retain skilled young professionals at your organizations is the first one. I think um, part of it is um, at the moment, and that's where I would come to in just a second, the geopolitical impact is that young and old talent um, are actually interested in staying closer to home. Um, I think due to COVID and lockdowns and travel restrictions and the like, what we've seen is that um, these places, uh, Cox's Bazaar, Yemen, uh, Haiti, Afghanistan, are I don't want to say less attractive, and they certainly need every talent they can get, but they are much more challenged with regard to um, attracting personnel because suddenly it's much more difficult to count on flights. It's much more difficult to ensure that we that we can guarantee um, that people can go home and see their families, colleagues can go home. So it's definitely one of the areas that I would say is the biggest challenge at the moment. Um, and in particular, in what we call rest and recuperation hardship locations, like Yemen or like Afghanistan, you fly in, you work hard for four to six weeks, and then you have an extra week of uh, rest and recuperation, uh, which is great if you can count on getting out. But I was just talking to a colleague who, uh, who worked in South Sudan, and 
colleagues were blocked in South Sudan for six months at a time in a container village without being able to go because of COVID and because of travel restrictions. So it's definitely a huge challenge. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest ones at the moment. Perfect. Another question about the business model. What is the business model here? Are all of the fundings from the United Nations and other similar organizations? No. Uh, AOM is a 100, well, no, 97% projectized organization, meaning it's voluntary contributions um, and funding uh, that come largely from governments. So donor governments, the United States, uh, Japan, Germany, the European Union, you name it. Uh, provide funding, often earmarked for specific activities. May it be the resettlement of refugees, may it be humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan, may it be um, <coughs> the question of um, emergency and and um, uh, cluster leads, shelter, shelter coordination, camp management and the like. Um, but it's largely uh, coming from um, voluntary com contributions from donors. We do also have joint funding pools for, with other UN entities that we can tap into, so, but that is not the largest part of IOM's uh, funding model. Okay, another question. Could you please enlighten us on how IOM personnel in conflict-prone areas are taken care of and security measures that are put in place to maintain their safety? Yes, um, it's obviously a huge, um, it's a huge, uh, hugely important question. Um, what we call the duty of care of the organization is to look after staff. And of course, it's very different from Yemen to Cox's Bazaar to Ukraine uh, at the moment. But uh, IOM is part of the security umbrella of uh, the United Nations, the UN uh, security system, UNDSS. And um, therefore, with the help of UNDSS and our own security personnel on the ground, we actually determine how staff members live, how they need to be uh, supported in terms of uh, you know, security in their houses, if they can live in individual uh, accommodation, private accommodation, or actually provide um, secure um, living conditions in uh, joint facilities. Um, I mentioned earlier, South Sudan, that's the case there. Certainly the case in Afghanistan, where our staff members uh, live in uh, joint accommodations. So, and that's where the security aspect comes in. Excellent. And there was another question about providing security in unprecedented circumstances, but you've, you've covered that quite well. We do have a question about the internship opportunity for migration and health policy, which one of our candidates is interested in, but sees that it's closed. And I just want to take this opportunity to remind everyone that we have IOM at their virtual stand with the recruiter standing by and ready to connect with you to answer specific questions about opportunities like that. Uh, so, Absolutely. Yeah. Several of them, actually. Uh, we have a handful of uh, colleagues in the booth, so I do invite everyone to go and talk to them including about internship opportunities and other um, uh, entry-level positions that we always have out on our website. Great. And we do have some more questions. In any of these, Anka, feel free to either respond to or sure. we can refer them to your colleagues. Uh, there was one about from which continent do you usually hire talent for countries uh, you mentioned earlier, for example, Sudan, Yemen, Afghanistan, and other such countries. 172 uh, countries currently, so it, they can come from everywhere. And I can speak about my own team. Uh, we're 25 colleagues and we are 18 nationalities, I think. So the normal thing is we're, uh, we're very diverse, we're very uh, multicultural, and we, uh, we recruit based on capacity, uh, flexibility, availability for those positions. And I don't have to tell you, if you apply to a position in Geneva, the competition is much higher than if you apply to a position in um, Central African Republic, where people are unsure about what will the living conditions be like, will I be able to travel, and and so forth. So we actually hire from the from the globe, uh, and we're trying to actually go to um, uh, as diverse and as qualified a workforce as we can. Excellent. And now a question about the new modes of work. 
freelancers, contractors, or other gig workers? How do you ensure company culture? Um, we are actually at the moment trying to really look at making sure that people get decent jobs, uh, meaning in our case, staff contracts. So we're really trying to get away from the freelance contractors and the like, but they still exist. But in order to provide the necessary support and, and uh, working conditions, uh, including um, contractual modalities, that's what we're actually aiming for. But what we're trying to do is obviously uh, make sure that wherever people go, um, they do get integrated uh, and onboarded uh, in order to make sure that they actually have the understanding of what IOM stands for. They are as bound by um, our code of conduct um, as, as I am uh, or other staff members. And <clears throat> so the idea is really to um, integrate them. And I think for what IOM is particularly good at is we normally don't make a difference. I think oftentimes people don't even know who's a staff, who's a contractor, who's a freelancer or a gig worker. Um, you become part of the IOM family, you get integrated and you work together. And that's how uh, we actually ensure that there is a good um, company culture across the board. Excellent. And now a question about volunteer work. And we know recently that volunteer work can be considered in 41% of the cases of hiring managers just as relevant, if not more than, than paid uh, full-time employment. What is IOM's experience? Do you require an experience in volunteer work or related areas in order to be able to apply to IOM? We don't require it, but it's certainly an asset, I would say, because it also shows a certain mentality, a certain uh, commitment to a cause that is relevant for us. So definitely, um, yes, we do um, encourage it and we, we do take it into account when reviewing profiles, but it is not a mandatory requirement. And now a question about how do Europeans understand local people's challenges then? Any insights on, on cross-cultural training, for example? That's a huge, I mean, I don't think it's Europeans uh, in local people's challenges. It's the same for Africans in other people's challenges or uh, Americans. I don't think I would say it's a European question. Um, I think it is by, by virtue of being so multicultural and so diverse, um, we normally have uh, international colleagues in all duty stations. And so we do do cross-cultural training. Uh, we make sure that uh, our colleagues have access to a better understanding. And then, of course, by the fact that 90% of our staff are local staff in their own countries and their own cultures, they obviously also support the international colleagues. But again, I want to make sure it's understood by no means are they only European or only American or only whatever. They're from anywhere in the world uh, if they've applied to an international position. Very clear. So we can stop there for just a moment with the questions and I'll let you carry on with the presentation and I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll cut in again in, in the near future. And I think I've said enough here and you've had a chance to look at it. If you have any questions on any of these scenarios, that's fine. Um, what I did want to talk about is this uh, a little bit further because Amber, you asked, and one of the, the um, colleagues asked about um, what are the restrictions and what are the challenges at the moment in terms of recruitment. So um, I already said uh, about COVID-19 and the, the question, uh, you know, people are less mobile, people want to be closer to home. Staff, um, regardless actually of their age or, or seniority, um, have that fear of being stuck by themselves somewhere far away and then maybe at home there's an emergency and they can't get to and we've seen those and we've seen plenty of them with awful situations so I, I can perfectly well understand where that's coming from but certainly from our uh, aspect and looking at the fact that we are um, working in so many difficult duty stations uh, in uh, in over 100 countries it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge to make sure that we actually still get people who are willing to go to these duty stations. Um, and we see um, that uh, now for Ukraine, for example, because it's the most acute one, uh, we have a need for emergency personnel. And that first problem applies again. 
Um, we also see that we have emotional challenges uh, of staff. Um, two years of lockdown and, and uncertainty and problems have also had an impact on, on our staff, on all of us. Um, we see an increased need for staff welfare support and the like, and we've definitely hugely increased our staff welfare workforce. But the other one, and that I think is interesting for me because my first job abroad was in Bosnia after the war, in the former Yugoslavia. And we're seeing that, and we have a lot of colleagues from Bosnia, Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia, Macedonia, Montenegro, uh, Kosovo, and the like. <coughs> and we do see a certain, I, I said here, re-traumatization, re because it feels to them like a deja vu. They, they seem to be living through their own uh, war uh, situation again now with Ukraine. So that's definitely also, even for quite um, senior and quite experienced staff, we're seeing that that is actually a challenge. Go ahead, the next slide. And um, I was just going to speak quickly about the different opportunities that we have uh, in becoming a member. So if you take the next slide, I can quickly have a look and then I'm happy to answer more questions if you have any, um, uh, Amber. But I think the important part is the value proposition that IOM, but the UN as a whole, um, actually has uh, to offer. And that, I think, is why we think considering in, an international career, but also a local career. Maybe there's an IOM office, uh, an IOM country office in your uh, location. We're also always looking for qualified local uh, staff. Um, so it's, it's very dynamic. It has this international outlook, even if you are working in your own country. There's a career path, and IOM has the advantage of certainly being one of the uh, organizations where even if you start as a local staff, there is no problem in growing through the ranks and becoming an international staff member. There's no glass ceiling as in some other um, agencies. Um, yeah, we uh, offer an attractive compensation package, uh, at least if you're international, also support for relocation. And there's health insurance, education, and so forth that is involved. Um, so for us, maybe, and that's the reason why I would say the vast majority of IOMers have joined. It's a job with a purpose, and that's what, what we all believe in. Go ahead. Next slide. So there, there are quite a few. And again, um, as, as we mentioned, we have a, a couple of colleagues in the booth. Feel free to go and talk to them and, and ask them with regular um, vacancy announcements uh, that are, that are uh, up on this uh, uh, on this IOM INT recruitment website, uh, we have shorter term uh, assignments. In particular, when it comes to very specialized uh, questions, some of your countries might have junior professional officer programs. That is a program where um, your government actually sponsors normally two years of. Uh, of a, of a um, secondment to IOM, not a secondment, a job with IOM. Um, and so that's actually an opportunity. I would definitely suggest you look into your uh, own countries, possibly Ministry of Foreign Affairs is the, is the hub. But as we said, we also have huge numbers of internships, um, including not only, but uh, a diversity internship that we have, in, especially for the Global South and our internships uh, are paid. So I would <coughs> definitely suggest that you um, go ahead and, uh, and um, have a look and also speak to the colleagues in the booth. Next Great. And I can, I, I can cut in with a couple of questions here. And we recently Pepper. conducted a talent survey and found that more than 80% of our talent are interested in remote opportunities. I, we have a two-part question regarding remote opportunities. First of all, can you provide insights on the dark side of flexible employment models? And does IOM have any examples on how global teams should work together? Um, yeah, I think um, exclusively remote, I think, is a challenge in particular at the beginning of one's career. So remote internships, for example, 
um, I think what I see with colleagues is they lead to extensively long working hours. And there's the challenge of not being able to cut off, uh, not being able to put a stop at it unless the manager really manages that well, in particular if you're across different time zones. So definitely a challenge. Does IOM have examples as to how should global teams work together? Well, I can tell you that's what we try to do in my team, as it's clearly one. Um, we have a, a good group, and probably two thirds of us are sitting in Europe, primarily at our headquarters in, in Geneva. But then uh, we have a good chunk uh, in uh, Manila, so six hours in one direction, and a good chunk in Panama, six or seven hours into the other direction. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that we do meet every other week all together. It means a bit early for the people in uh, Panama and it means a bit late for the people in the Philippines. But what we're trying to do is at least every other week, make sure that we as a team work together. And actually the colleagues in Panama and Manila said, we're actually thankful to the pandemic because it has led to us being much more part of the team than we were before. Before we were using, you know, we, we might have done a follow up um, once every so often, but we didn't have this regular communications uh, mechanisms online through whatever Zoom, Teams, um, whatever else we use. And they actually say, we really feel much more integrated than we did. But again, I think it's also something where you need to make sure that you're managing the workloads and the time zones quite distinctly, because otherwise it leads to the fact that people work way too long and way too much. Uh, and I think that leads then to burnout, to overload, and a lot of the staff uh, welfare, mental health needs that I was speaking about earlier. Yes, it can have serious repercussions. Now. Yeah. Clearly, there is a tremendous diversity amongst the personnel at IOM. There's a question with regards to the educational backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And what educational background do the majority or most people working at IOM have? Um, I don't think um, that's quite as clear because it depends on whether you're looking at local staff or, or uh, international staff. Uh, I can tell you that for international staff, you need at least a bachelor degree uh, and as of a certain seniority level. So if you want to move through the ranks, also uh, a master. So what I would definitely suggest is that if that's something you are interested in or you wouldn't exclude maybe also later uh, on, do invest time in your education and do make sure that you have a degree. Because oftentimes it's, uh, I'll deal with that later. And then suddenly the it's already later and suddenly you don't have the degree and the perfect dream opportunity comes up and you're unable to take it on. So um, I would definitely say, I mean, we have a lot of people obviously who like me are a lawyer. We have a lot of people who have international relations or migration, if, if we're looking at that angle, um, peace building, um, peace and security and, and those uh, aspects. Uh, human rights, um, but of course, then also on the operational front, on the operations support, uh, we have an enormous amount of accountants, um, IT technicians, IT um, engineers. Um, but uh, again, I mean, HR professionals, you name it. I don't think there's any one background that is particularly important, but what I would underscore is make sure you come with a degree it's not that we don't have colleagues with high school degrees, but of course that does create the glass ceiling that will actually make sure that you're not able to move on to an international position. Did that answer your question, Amber? Amber, did you abandon me? Okay, I don't see her for the time being, but maybe uh, we can go on with the last couple slides then. Hmm. Hello, can you guys still hear me, the audience? Why am I here by myself? Hmm. 
Okay, good. If you can hear me, then I will just keep talking um, because I think uh, I might still have a few things to say. Um, when it comes to leadership and when it comes to uh, you know managing your teams and so forth, I think what's important and in that is that is obviously something that uh, um, is for the recruitment side of things. We're looking at um, flexibility. We're looking at uh, competence. We're looking at team capacity. Um, so we absolutely want people who are able to work in multicultural teams. We absolutely a, a want people who are interested in sharing and, and working together. Um, and so I think that's that's super crucial. I often get asked the question of um, how do colleagues, how, how do we actually do interviews? And one is obviously that um, we do we often do a written test, uh, anonymized written test up front, depending on what you apply to. Uh, but you might be asked to do a little essay. You might be asked to do some Excel uh, accounting work. You might be uh, whatever the point is. Um, and then comes a competency-based interview. Um, so we then go through um, the different competencies. And there, I would definitely suggest you practice that. My boss, Michael Emery, has done a brilliant video. It's available on YouTube. Um, so if you uh, Google Michael Emery uh, competency-based interview, you'll see him in his role at the time still at UNFPA. But it actually explains really well on how to go through interviews and how to actually make sure that you get your dream job. Because um, having done interviews myself as a candidate several times, I do think half Half the stuff is really being prepared, having thought about what questions might come and having formulated what answers might come, including if the interview might be in more than one language, having um, done the preparation in both languages. So I definitely would suggest um, that is something to do. So Amber has decided not to come back, I think. Um, but what I would, ah, there she is. Okay, um, glad you're back and glad to have your help again. Uh, I was just talking to the uh, to the audience about uh, competency-based interviews and that the whole question of being well prepared is half the success already on the way to getting your dream job. Absolutely. <clears throat> and there was a question from the audience as well as opportunities in the UK. I'm not sure if you touched on that one while we were off air. Nope, not yet. Um, we have some uh, opportunities in the UK. We have a relatively large office with quite a few local colleagues. Um, and so, yes, definitely check out the IOM UK website for potential job opportunities. The other one that I personally use a lot and where I find a lot is reliefweb.int and uh, that has a lot of opportunities also when it comes to consultancies or internships um, in the various uh, countries so definitely have a look and IOM posts a lot out there as we also do on LinkedIn. Perfect we have several more questions coming from the audience apologies if you've already covered any of these while I was off air a great question very connected with the title of this session the geopolitical impact on talent acquisition how is the response of the local population when refugees are offered jobs that might increase competition for them? Um, that's a super good question. But um, I think what we're trying to do more and more is make sure that um, we don't only have jobs for the beneficiaries, but that it's actually a coordinated effort that benefits both the beneficiaries, and again, it might not be just refugees, it might be internally displaced persons, it might be uh, other types of uh, beneficiaries. We're trying to make sure that we're also supporting the host population because we otherwise really have a challenge, uh, uh, as the, the colleague rightly or the, the uh, audience rightly said, in making sure that um, there's no competition between the two. So we're trying to make sure that it actually works both ways, working with the beneficiaries and the host population. Excellent. Now, a question about, do you hire people who don't have international experience 
of working with governmental institutions? Oh, we all started somewhere. Um, and it depends if you're a nurse or a doctor and you want to do medical stuff for our beneficiaries, then you don't need to. So it really depends on A, which level are you actually starting at? If you're an intern uh, or if you're starting with a with an intro uh, entry level position, then we're not expecting that type of um, experience. And of course, also if you're a security personnel or if you're an accountant or something of that nature. So it really depends on what job. Of course, if you're applying to a middle management liaison officer or, uh, you know, um, I don't know, migration governance or, or that type of position, chief of mission, head of office position, yes, then we would expect that type of uh, experience. But however, um, if you're at, a, at an entry level, no, that's not what's required. At the, you're at the beginning of your career and we all started somewhere at some point. Great. Now, a personal question about your own journey there. Uh, mm -hmm. What is your personal motivation for working at IOM? Um, I guess the, the fact that I've always thought um, I've been really lucky in life. Uh, I was born into a middle class family in a nice country, Germany, with a very helpful passport. Um, and I've always had the impression um, I don't want to make my law degree uh, useful for the increase of benefits of some company selling cars or uh, whatever. Um, I wanted to do something with it that was meaningful. And that's what I meant with the job with the purpose. It always spoke to me. And so um, for the longest time, it was uh, working with external beneficiaries. Um, and now for the past four years, actually thinking that maybe my experience helps uh, colleagues to, or have that snowball effect of supporting colleagues in order to do even uh, even more with the purpose. Very good. And I remember it was approximately a year ago at the 2021 fairs when we asked you about flexibility. And for you, flexibility meant being open to assignments in seven different countries. Flexibility is still top on employers' requirements these days. Has your view of flexibility changed at all in this last year? My personal view has changed in the sense that, as I said earlier, uh, it's become a challenge for IOM as a recruiting agency. Um, but uh, from, a, from an HR, from a recruitment perspective, I can't be having a different view on flexibility because our needs and those of our beneficiaries and, our, and the government is where they are. So we can't say we all want to be living close to home and we all want to be working, um, uh, you know, as comfortably from Paris, London, Geneva or Berlin um, or Bangkok or New York or Buenos Aires or, um, I don't know, Nairobi uh, when, um, when the needs are not there. We actually need to go where the needs are and that's our mandate and that's what it comes to. And I think in particular uh, in an organization like that, and that's why IOM, why IOM has still for international staff members as of a middle management grade, a mandatory rotation, which means every three to five years, depending on where you are located, you will be requested to move. So yes, I think I can understand why people who've been stuck in South Sudan or in Cox's Bazaar for six months and couldn't go home to see their family, their children, or or their, an elderly parent died while they were away and they couldn't go and see them. Yes, I completely understand that flexibility is difficult. On the other hand, if you work in an organization like IOM, we need to be where the needs are. We need to be where the demands are, both for beneficiaries as well as for our governments. So right. it's not no. always convenient. Another question connected with that flexibility, since the regulations and laws of the districts are usually unknown by applicants. Do you integrate them and make sure their rights are preserved? I'm not sure I understood that question. So my understanding is given such flexibility and global talent being sent on different assignments to different destinations where perhaps they're not so familiar with local laws and regulations, how are you ensuring that their rights are protected in, in such target 
countries were there being destined and sent on assignment? Um, we, we, of course, always have strong local um, staff uh, support. And so um, we have a resource management unit or legal unit or a, a unit that deals with protocol uh, questions vis-a-vis -vis the host government, where uh, obviously the, the, the international staff who comes in is being uh, briefed and is being informed about what are the limitations, what's, uh, what are the rights or the uh, yeah, limitations they need to be aware of, the laws, the, the challenges they might have. Absolutely, we actually have the local um, support there, but also at the bigger level, we have a, a unit in Geneva at our um, headquarters that actually deals with these protocol questions and provides uh, answers where necessary. Very good. Now, a bit of a statement from uh, one of our audience viewers, and I just want to get your reaction to this. Uh, I've, I've been looking for a job with a purpose. I'm ready for Ukraine. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts on that? Um, do apply, depending obviously what your background is. Um, depending also on, on experience and age, I, I just hope want to put a little bit of a warning sign out there that sometimes that experience can be quite different, quite a bit more overwhelming or quite a bit more uh, challenging than what the applicant might expect. Um, I've had colleagues myself and also interns and students who came who, and it wasn't a war like Ukraine, it was actually maybe different uh, environments, but where colleagues, even those that had some years of experience, and for example, I have a colleague in Mauritania who said, I absolutely want to work in emergencies. She said, here's your opportunity. Uh, go on a short-term assignment. Um, we have this demand and we'll you know, back you up here uh, with your job. He came back and he was devastated. He said, that was absolutely not what I expected. I was held at gunpoint. I was homesick and the like. So what I'm trying to say is, it's great to apply, it's great to try it out, but maybe also be ready for um, testing it first. Uh, you know, don't sell your house, your uh, car, your whatever, and go, and suddenly two months later you, you realize, oh my God, this is absolutely not what I expected and what I'm willing or ready or capable of doing going forward. Great advice. And now an interesting question. If you could call your 20 year old self with a magical phone, what personal or professional advice would you give yourself? I would give myself the advice to regularly check if I'm still on the right track and not just be in that wheel of motions of where you just held by the golden handcuff, so to speak, uh, and make sure, for example, uh, people suddenly maybe 10 years into their career say, I'd uh, die to go back home and I would want to, and suddenly it's no longer that much of an option. Um, so I think I would give myself the advice of checking in. I think I would still be where I am today um, or, or would have gone down the, right, the same path, but I would have told myself to reflect, to really put myself regular reflection points, I guess, along the way to make sure that uh, I'm not you know, just happen to be ending somewhere where there's no way back. Very good. And so in that sense, have you had a mentor in your career who you've looked to? At times, um, maybe you yeah, felt stuck? I've or... actually had, I've been super lucky with, with supervisors to start with. I've really had um, wonderful supervisors. And I think one of my very last slides is a, a quote by John Taffer, says the greatest lift, gift of leadership is a boss who wants you to be successful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely critical. And that was clearly my um, <clears throat> uh, my own situation. I've only had uh, bosses who really wanted me to be successful, who provided me with the, with the guidance, the mentoring, if I wanted it, um, the support, um, and the, just the understanding, the open ear, where I could also maybe ask critical questions um, about 
do I apply to another job? Of course, that would be a problem for the boss, possibly. But actually <laughs> getting that guidance and, and making sure that, um, uh, you know, I was giving the best uh, for for the job with the purpose that, that we've been talking about. Excellent. And I'm always encouraging the the candidates to consider the interviews as their opportunity to interview that future employer. And it's so vital that you're getting in there with someone who will provide for your growth within the organization. So great advice with regards to the boss. We have more questions coming in, Anka. Uh, this one, very interesting. If there are two applicants that have the same competencies, but one needs a visa sponsor and one doesn't need it, who would you go with and how do you ensure the fair recruitment in this case? If it's an international position, we just take care of the visa. So that's not uh, not a point. Um, and um, that's a normal situation where we think, um, I mean, in an international organization and with the, in the UN environment, it's normal that the organization supports the visa. Uh, when it comes to an international, to a local position, probably the person who needs a visa sponsor wouldn't be eligible to apply to the job. So I almost want to say we wouldn't find ourselves in that position because for international jobs we'd provide the we'd be the sponsor IOM would be the sponsor, and for local positions, someone who who doesn't have the right to work and who does who needs a visa sponsor would not be considered for the job. Very good. Now, with regards to the selection process, are you using technology in your recruitment processes? Um, to some degree we are, um, but much more with regard to uh, video interviewing, video technologies um, and these kind of things. We're not yet there with regard to sorting people out. I mean, yes, we're sorting people out if, for example, for a position fluency in English and Arabic is required and the person speaks Spanish and French. Yes, that is used by technology to sort these people out these ineligibility candidates, but not further than that at this point in time. Okay, and has AI replaced any jobs at IOM? Not yet, I think. Okay, very good. Uh, I would really love to work with IOM because their values matches with my beliefs on empowering and helping and building people and community. I'm the next IOM employee, so we're getting some great feedback here. Well, uh, hope and to see you soon. Another one in terms of your advice with regards to having that boss, uh, how do you create such bosses is the question. We're trying to train our, our colleagues. Um, and um, so doing um, trainings on people management, on, uh, you know, leadership that actually provides the necessary uh, support and understanding, compassion. Uh, we run a regular course for leaders on compassionate leadership. Um, so we're trying to do that. Um, I always think leading by example is an important piece of uh, the puzzle. Um, and I think also, and um, that's what I try to say to the people who report to me, it's also the opportunity to provide feedback by the employer and saying, Anke, sorry, but there you really messed up or there you were re you were really not re there for me. Um, you let me down. I think we, l we learn from that type of um, uh, feedback and criticism if you want. And of course, it's not very pleasant. But on the other hand, I do think that in such an environment, this type of feedback and criticism is necessary. Um, and for example, I, I sometimes say to my boss, listen, Michael, but this doesn't work. Um, and it's not very pleasant. And it's not that, you know, I'm not sitting there thinking, can I actually, do I dare to say that? Um, but I do think um, it's, so it's training on the one hand, leading by, an, on, by example on another, but also having the courage to manage upwards. Excellent. Now we have a, a great statement here from the audience and I just want to get your feedback having had all of those international assignments, having the experience of living in an African country that experienced serious challenge and having overcome this challenge, there is no better way to give back to the world than working with people. 
Has this been your experience? Anything in particular stand out from your career journey that you want to share with our audience as we finalize the session? Um, this uh, statement clearly stands with me and my personal uh, experience uh, is clearly that um, the change in duty stations, the change in jobs and locations and, and crisis uh, situations um, has, I think, uh, certainly had an impact on humility because you realize, my God, I've, I've really been lucky in my life and in my situation, work and non-work related. But I think um, the other one is also um, to be well prepared to, to have this whole cultural element that you referred to, Amber, earlier, um, to, to prepare for that, to not march in there as the blonde German woman who thinks she can do it all, knows it all, but to actually try to, to learn more and try to adapt uh, as we go. And I can only say, for example, I moved from New York to Morocco and then to Mauritania. And I'm really glad I had Morocco between New York and Mauritania because I think otherwise it would have been quite a, quite a uh, stretch. But Morocco gave me some sort of guidance on my way for the south to, uh, to West Africa. Um, and trying to adapt to those situations, trying to also learn about what have I learned in my previous job, but also what's different in this country. Morocco and Mauritania are two completely different countries, for example. Um, and so this uh, attempt in, in trying to learn from your various um, situations and adapt, and, and in particular also learn from the local colleagues, try to understand, uh, try to ask their guidance, try to really benefit from their knowledge and their skills. Excellent career advice and, of course, life advice. As we finish the session here, I just want to share a couple of the comments we've had from the audience. Thank you. A big thank you to Anka Strauss and Amber. This has been truly engaging and enlightening. Thank you for your time. Uh, this has been so insightful. We get to know so much about IOM and its culture. You are a true representation of this venture at UN. I hope all bosses do this. So I want to thank you once again, Anka. Do you want to, anything that you want to say just as you leave our audience with any final words of advice? If you do want a job with purpose, do apply, prepare well. Um, and if you read the position description or the terms of reference, depending on what you're applying to, make sure your CV actually reflects what the person who wrote the terms of reference or the position description had in mind. Perfect. And so, so timely that comment, because we have our next CV clinic coming up from 4 to 5 p.m. CEST. We will be co-hosted by Audencia Business School, Julien, and we have Isis from Fortinet. So come and get some insight, uh, inside expert advice on your CVs. I want to thank Anka Strauss once again, head of the Integrated Talent Management Unit at UN's International Organization for Migration. Thank you for your generosity, Anka, and for this valuable advice and insights. It's always a pleasure to have you, and I encourage everyone out there interested in a career with purpose to head on over to the virtual stand of IOM and connect with your colleagues. Indeed. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, Amber. It's been a pleasure to be with you again. Likewise. Bye-bye.